Hello, hello, good evening. Thank you all for joining us this evening from wherever you're coming in from. Welcome, and please could you type in the chat where you're joining from today and how many people are watching with you? Also, if you're able, can you please tell us the native land which you occupy? And if you don't know, you can go to native-land.ca. I will type it right here into the chat. Land.ca. Okay, great. We've got Julie from Chicago, just herself, Potawatomi, and a bunch more. Julia and Evanston, welcome. Uh, Native Lands of the, the Council of the Three Fires. Thank you, Julia. Sharon, uh, coming in from Colorado. Thanks, guys. Uh, if you're just joining us, oh, Liz is here from Westchester, also the Council of the Three Fires. Thank you all for being here. Please keep checking in. We'd love to have your voices fill the room, um, see each other all together here. Helen, thanks for being here from Chicago. Just you, wonderful. Dana from Connecticut. Thanks, Dana. Glad you're with us. Uh, Hannah, Hannah in Chicago, uh, Potawatomi lands. Great. I'll have you guys keep checking on in. Thanks so much for doing that. And uh, I'll move us forward. So I'm Anna Garcia Doyle, the executive director of One Earth Collective, which produces the One Earth Film Festival. Welcome to this screening event, um, which is part of our uh, Earth Week mini film festival in continuing partnership with the city of Chicago. Uh, we hope tonight will provide all of us with rich opportunities for learning and a brave and safe space for important conversations, as well as a way to move from inspiration to action. Just wanna thank our uh, Earth Week title sponsor this evening, the Chicago Community Trust. Thank you so much. And uh, also, uh, if you have time or inclination, um, please donate to uh, One Earth Film Fest's year-round um, nonprofit, free programming and events. Welcome to One Earth's Earth Week Mini Film Festival in continuing partnership with the city of Chicago. The One Earth team, together with Chicago's Chief Sustainability Officer, Angela Tovar, and her team, invite you to join us in turning the tide on our climate crisis. This week, we're joining forces in using the power of film to create a sea change on topics of environment and those intersected with environment, like racial, social, and economic justice. Here is a brief word from Angela now. Hello, my name is Angela Tobar, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Chicago. It's an incredible honor to be here with you and to partner with One Earth to bring you another exciting Earth Day mini film festival. We commend the One Earth Collective for curating this incredible lineup of films and for all of the important programming that they lead year round to foster thought provoking dialogues on pressing environmental issues through a justice lens. This Earth Week, the City of Chicago will release its updated climate goals through the 2022 Climate Action Plans to identify new and ambitious targets and to reaffirm our commitment to climate action and the delivery of equitable co benefits that our communities need to thrive. We look forward to joining you all for an exciting week of film viewing and discourse and a continued partnership to move the city toward a more just and equitable climate future. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for your words and for your continuing collaboration. As we celebrate the 52nd anniversary of Earth Day this week, we continue our hybrid fest format presenting virtual and Chicago area in-person events. And we remain committed to our unique community-based model of raising awareness, engaging in dialogue, and being inspired to act on behalf of our one Earth. A powerful image and call to collective action in light of this year's festival theme, Turn the Tide, are the words of Japanese writer Ryanusuk Satoru. Individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. As always, our agenda will be to introduce you to folks who will join us in a rich discussion after the film, to watch the film together, to unpack the film's themes with our facilitator and panelists. Please participate using the chat. And finally, to share actions we can all take to be part of the solution. I'd now like to make a few brief acknowledgements. First, as we reframe narratives around justice, environment, and equitable solutions to our climate crisis, we acknowledge the many filmmakers and subjects, facilitators, and panelists joining us this week. Thank you. Second, One Earth Collective is based in Chicago, the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations, and home to many other tribes, including today, peoples from over 100 tribal nations. And yet there are no federally recognized tribes in Illinois, due in part to colonization, relocation, and genocide. One Earth commits to including films that center indigenous stories and voices. Beyond acknowledging the native lands we each occupy, we must lift up and support the work of First Nations groups. If you're in the Chicago area, please support the important work of the American Indian Center Chicago, Indigenous Environmental Network, 
Shy Nations Youth Council, and others. And watch for Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories, an exhibition co-curated by the Field Museum and collaborators from more than 100 tribes, opening next month. A third acknowledgement. Shared agreements can help our conversation remain safe and respectful. When participating today, please put aside your preconceptions, acknowledge your privilege, internalize what you've learned, approach the conversation with respect, engage your active listening, and use I statements and get comfortable with your own story. A quick note before we meet our facilitator and program participants, please amplify today's voices on social media. The hashtags for the festival are hashtag OEFF2022 and hashtag Turn the tide. And now I'd like to turn it over to our facilitator to introduce themselves, the panelists, and our film. Hi, thanks, Anna. Hi, everybody. My name is Susan Lucci, and I'm so excited to be your discussion facilitator for tonight's event. This is my 10th year facilitating for the One Earth Film Fest. And in addition to all the amazing humans that I get to meet, uh, what I love about being part of this process is the inspiration and the action that flows uh, every time we interact with each other. And tonight our emphasis in three different films is on the power of the people. And we're gonna watch three films telling stories about people coming together and taking things into their own hands to create clean energy alternatives. Clean air is an important facet of this work throughout our uh, films tonight. And as Anna once said, if you breathe air, then you're in our movement. So let's begin by taking a deep breath together. Maybe just exhaling, letting go of where you've been, what's happened today. And continue to keep breathing, to be present. We really invite in your presence, your voices along in our conversation. And once we breathe together, we are co-conspirators. And this work is impossible to do alone. So I'm glad that you're here today. A little bit about our process at the, at the One Earth Film Fest, if you are a first timer here. Uh, think about how many movies you've watched during the last two years during the, uh, the COVID quarantine we're coming out of. So often we watch movies and just get on to the next thing without deeply reflecting on what we've seen, how we feel about it, or pause to consider how it might change our lives and what we might do differently. In our fest, we have a whole team of volunteers. They spend months consciously reviewing and reflecting to find movies that will inspire and hopefully transform us. So tonight we look forward to engaging with you after we watch these three films together in some reflection, some deeper dialogue, and then moving into action. I like to think about it, our, our head, our hearts, and our hands. So you might consider how each of those are being moved as we move through this evening. So tonight we will uh, have these films, they've grouped together about the clean energy revolution, beginning with the Midwest premiere of El Poder de Pueblo, followed by a short discussion. And then we're gonna view Dangerous Neighbor and Community Power Indiana Beyond the Line, followed by another discussion. Uh, we look forward to your participation participation tonight. You've already been invited to check in in the chat. And so we'll continue to invite you to share your reflections, your questions, and eventually how you're inspired to take action. Here in our 11th year, the One Earth uh, Collective continues to grow an ever widening community, thanks to the effort of Anna and her team, who are so passionate and lovingly, uh, lovingly build this community. Uh, tonight, we have two really awesome uh, inspiring panelists. I can't wait to engage them. Uh, and they are fully engaged in the work of environmental justice. So let's give a warm welcome to Katie McFadden from McFadden Strategies, LLC. Hey, Katie, I'm so glad you're here. And Kyra Woods from the city of Chicago. So you are not going to want to miss a minute uh, with these two just amazing dynamos. We're gonna learn a lot more about what they are up to uh, after the film. So let me introduce our first film tonight, El Poder del Pueblo. Uh, as you probably have been tracking, Puerto Rico has experienced some of the most extreme weather over the last two decades. Hurricane Maria destroyed the island's electrical grid four years ago and left residents in the dark for months. The fragile power system is still unreliable and it's prompted mass protest and calls to move away from dirty power and turn the island into a center for renewable energy. This is in fact the movement that's featured in this 2021 film, uh, which means the power of the people. Collective energies radically reimagine community organizing. 
you will see folks join, and this joins the larger movement with people and places around the world struggling for environmental, climate, and energy justice. So let's watch together as the Huobos Bay residents take power into their own hands to confront environmental racism and injustice and resist the toxic assault of power plants and other ex extractivist industries. So for the next 40 minutes or so, we're gonna enjoy our first film, and then I'll see you right back here for the conversation with our panelists. Enjoy the show. Welcome back, everyone. We'll hop into our discussion in a few moments, but in the chat, I would love to hear from you, our audience, uh, if there was a scene, a person, a line, something in the film that stood out to you. Could you go ahead and type that in the chat? For me, the, uh, the scene that really stays with me is that really tense moment about half of the way through when there were the lines of the police and I kept wondering like, what? who are they defending and the lines of the people defending the air that we breathe and then just watching it again for the the third or fourth time i was just so struck by the the cars and trucks and all those all those black flags at it again so let me check the chat anything coming in yeah we are a small group thanks hannah but we are a necessary group Feels good to matter, right? Yeah. Hmm. Thanks, Julia, yeah, the man who lost his mother. Really compelling. Anything else? Anything else that stood out? Something that you'll just remember, maybe even if it's just an image or a felt sense. Love to have you just share your voices in this way on the chat. Mm, yeah, maybe it's so touching. We're we're still processing it, so that's fine. And and I just invite you to to use the chat as you wish to um, to weigh in as we open up our discussion here. Uh, if you have questions or comments, or or it comes to you as we open up our conversation. Um, yeah, Bonnie and Jeff, thank you. Everyone is important. Okay, great. Well, it is my um, great pleasure to welcome two amazing women to our Zoom stage here. Uh, Katie McFadden is a political consultant who focuses on environmental issues. In addition to founding McFadden Strategies, McFadden Strategies, I can't mispronounce your name, Katie, she has led multiple coalitions and campaigns to make meaningful progress, and boy has she, on climate, the labor movement, and women's policy. Uh, just for one example, she spent three years in Peoria, Illinois, helping to start the campaign to close down the Edwards coal plant. So you will see her and her work featured in tonight's second film, Dangerous Neighbor. And then I'd also, hi Katie, I'd like to welcome uh, Kyra to our Zoom stage. Kyra Woods is a policy advisor in the Office of Sustainability at the City of Chicago. Kyra previously worked with the Sierra Club, Illinois chapter, as the Ready for 100 Chicago campaign coordinator. She believes that Chicago's monumental commitment can lead to significant economic health and environmental benefits for residents if it's steeped in the values of racial equity, justice, and community leadership. Kyra is also a member of Environmentalist of Color, and she was recently recognized in Energy News Network's 40 Under 40 uh, list of clean energy leaders. So welcome to the stage. Excellent. Thanks so much. Yeah, great. Kyra and Katie, I'd love to just start with if there if there was a, a powerful or memorable scene or person or something from the film, just to to bring you in on having just watched this film together. So um, Katie, you want to start? Sure. I was just struck by how many similarities I noticed, especially um, as you mentioned, I spent many years fighting um, a coal-fired power plant here in the state of Illinois. And uh, just how in solidarity I felt with the folks that were fighting this when, because there were so many similarities, even the small things like the fingerprints of dust was something that stood out to me. Just, you know, having also knocked on doors 
uh, of people who live next to coal-fired power plants in Illinois and them also having the same thing, uh, same complaint. Um, uh, obviously, the health problems that you hear about are the same as folks that I met the very first time we ever had a community meeting about the coal-fired power plant. You kind of heard the same thing, like, oh, I never even had considered that there was a problem with letting my children play in the river or in why maybe so many health problems exist in the community near the coal plant. Um, and so it was really those similarities um, to the work. But then I will say one, um, one other point that obviously stood out to me is, is what you mentioned, Susan, was the really powerful moment with the line um, of police. And it also just makes you really think about, you know, the work that we do as activists, um, you know, it can be easy to take for granted in a way. Um, you know, we live in a, a, a very much a democracy and but the and the work that can sometimes feel, you know, we're, we're fighting against very powerful interests, but we do have this freedom to fight in, and, um, you know, and not every single country is the same, not that it necessarily was the case in this film, but it, it does just make you think about the kinds of tactics that we take, um, that we use to take action, um, you know, in some places in the world are, are not actually allowed. And so, you know, how they're met and what type of resistance and what level of resistance um, uh, that you encounter as an activist just can really vary depending on where you live. So, you know, recognizing those similarities and differences um, was a really powerful moment for me. Oh, thank you, Katie. Yeah, really touching. Thank you. Uh, Kyra, how about for you? Yeah, there are actually three distinct scenes that continue to come back for me. The first is in the beginning where the camera has a, a shot of tomatoes on a vine and then the plant in the background, the coal-fired power plant. And I thought that was really striking because sometimes it's easy to um, not see some signs or to see the existence of life or vibrancy and for some people to say, see, things aren't that bad. Um, and so there were actually a number of plants in, in that particular home's yard, um, but there were all these other things going on and, and who knows how vibrant or full or nutritious that garden could be without that type of contamination. Um, so that was really striking and I thought a really good uh, juxtaposition. I was also really struck by the gentleman who shared the story about um, he and his pregnant wife moving to the neighborhood. And when he was at the hospital realizing that he knew the faces in the waiting room as the people who he had known his whole life in the community. And even though they weren't friends or maybe he didn't know them by name, he knew them by face. And that like striking moment uh, when you realize that you actually are in something together, I think can be very powerful and also a very daunting feeling. I, I think that's the, the moment for some people or the series of moments that can either feel uh, life affirming or you know truly um, can really bring people together to call for change as well. And uh, I was thinking about grappling with, you know, maybe several trips to the hospital like that. And then I want to say the third thing, I know you asked for one, but these three like keep coming to mind. The third, is when, <laughs> the third is when one community member was showing the, uh, the accumulation of coal ash on the walk path. And he said, this has been accumulating for 10 years. And they said it was going to go away. And he just kept scratching away. Um, and it reminded me of some of my travels to other places. And in 10 years, that may be the only thing that a, a, a kid may know, right, or a new community member may understand, and just how quickly time can go by to prevent us from, remember, from remembering what things used to be. Um, and so I thought that was a really striking, but very uh, tangible way to say, you know, we have reasons to mistrust, you know, and we see it every day, and you may walk by it every day. If you don't know the story, if that history isn't passed on, or if people aren't documenting or keeping the stories alive, it's it's really easy to accept things as the way of life, even though they could or have been different. Mm, wow, beautiful reflections. Thank you both. Wow. Um, there is a comment uh, from one of our audience as well, and, and leads me to my next question about youth. And I, I think there are folks in this film from 17 to 70 that participated. Um, and I think it's really great that they have a space to contribute, um, the film certainly emphasizes their enthusiasm, and then even says, "Well, these they're learning things not taught in school." That that kind of struck me too. Is like, why aren't these very practical things taught in school? 
Um, and so I'm thinking about youth and the engagement of youth in, in this movement and why it is so important and they are so powerful. Um, and, and in fact, Mabet um, Colon Perez, who was going to be here tonight, um, was featured in the film um, and cannot, but um, I found out that she recently wrote a book for children called Environmental Justice is for You and Me. And I was like, wow, how do you take that topic down for children? But anyway, um, I, I'd love to hear each of you talk about in your own work, what the role of youth, um, recognizing that you are younger than I am, but I mean, even younger. <laughs> so um, yeah, Katie, you're unmuted. Let's start with you, please. Sure. and. You know, I got my start and I'll, I'll start by saying I got my start in this movement as a student activist. I um, became very mad and sad and angry and riled up about climate um, in college and decided this was what I wanted to devote my life to. Um, and so I, I think there's real power in youth because um, young people, these issues are a lot clearer to young people. Um, and when I was, you know, 19 and made that decision for myself it was very clear what should and shouldn't happen in the world and there was really nothing you could do to stop me and so engaging young people in this movement has always been a priority in my work obviously because that background but because of the energy that they bring and the clarity that they bring um and so i, I i'll speak a little to the purity example because you're going to meet a couple of the young people that i had a chance of working with um, in this upcoming film um but uh, I'll, I'll start by saying when we first First, kind of launched the campaign. I started with meeting with all the um, folks who had been organizing in the community for a while, and so you know they were uh, they were not the youth. <laughs> um, they had been working in uh, environmental fights for a while, and so you know having meeting with them and really understanding the history of environmental uh, injustice in Peoria was a really important place to start. And they were so motivated when we did start to attract more students, more young people into the movement because for so long they had felt like they were the only ones fighting this and that really no one else cared and it just wasn't true once we found a way to connect with young people to talk about these issues to say hey this isn't right and we're going to do something about it that did attract young folks and so um two young women you'll meet um in the in the upcoming film first leanne who was in middle school i think in the very first community meeting we had about the peoria coal plant um and uh has suffered from asthma and didn't really realize that uh, it was from the plant or that you could even do something about it. And she speaks to that in the upcoming film. Um, and then Alyssa, who was a high school student at the community, or sorry, a, a community college student um, in Peoria and was always showing up to events and bringing friends and very engaged and got a bus on a bus with us to DC to even fight for stronger federal climate protections that could help the plant. And so just really thinking about the energy um, and the clarity and, and just the, the tactical um, uh, acumen that they bring to these fights as well. Uh, the intergenerational uh, nature of the movement was a, a huge reason why we were so successful. Oh, wow. Yeah, thank you for, for naming all of those points. Um, Really, really powerful. And Kyra, I read that that you knew very on, uh, early on that this was your work as well. So I'd love to hear your take on it. More yes. Perhaps. So I actually made my way to this space um, maybe junior or senior year in high school through a club, but um, it has definitely been more refined over time. It was uh, through a, I feel, I feel silly saying it, but it's my truth, so I'll share. Um, I was a part of our model United Nations team in high school, and that was, that was my jam. Uh, and at, at one point, we were talking about uh, the importance of access to clean water and truly that connection between clean environment and a healthy environment and healthy communities. I remember coming home and very clearly saying, clearly saying to my mom and my parents at the time, you know, like, this is it, you know, this, it was to Katie's point, it was clear as day um, that the issues or the, the problems, the, the, the hurdles were, they were complex, but they were surmountable or they needed to be addressed. And I think that conference really showed me also that the burdens were not carried by everyone across the world in the same way. Um, and so that international context is actually what really drew me um, into that space or initially. And over time, it's been 
um, I think very humbling and um, and grateful for the ways that I've understood, you know, the history of that work also here in America and in, of course, even locally here in Chicago. So, um, so yes, I also got, <laughs> it wasn't necessarily a campaign initially, but um, understanding subject matter, um, or at least the beginnings of it, that that started really early. And then to your point about how do you how do you boil this down for young people? To Katie's point, it, I mean, it's yes, youth. Sometimes there is a simplicity that you know. Once you get older, you recognize some more of the strings and the, the nuances of conversations. But in the same way that we teach children and our young people the basics of like this is a picture of a beach, right? Um, and get them to learn vocabulary like that, that's not actually in everybody's community or not something that everybody has access to, or that picture of the beach may not look like the picture of the beach in your neighborhood. Um, and so it's thinking about some of those normalized language, um, that normalized vocabulary or scenery or expectation of what uh, these places and, and um, structures and communities look like um, that I think people can very clearly say, that's not what this is like in my community, and then begin to question why or why not. And so I do agree that while youth participation was really powerful, that intergenerational coordination is always, I think, critical to movements, because that institutional knowledge and the people who have been through the fire a few times, or maybe even were part of the making some of the decisions that have created some of the current hurdles, I think sometimes that's important, um, and particularly when people are humble enough to say, you know, yes, that's what we decided then, but when you can kind of put your pride aside and say it doesn't have to remain that way and invite that new energy and direction of, of youth or uh, just new paradigms, period, no matter your age, then I think shift can happen, and it's really, really powerful, too. Oh, absolutely. And and I think um, there's a couple comments in the chat about this and I and I can't um, omit. Uh, I, I think this these quotes, women are the strength in this effort. We are the ones who are there. We don't give up. We persevere until we achieve what we want. Um, you know, really, I think this this film showed with youth, also the the female, especially the the elder. So um, could you each speak uh, a little bit about your unique role as a woman in this movement, too? Well, I would love to. Yes, thanks. So <laughs> I think it's enough. definitely true. Uh, the in in Peoria, the folks who I mentioned, it was largely uh, a female-driven existing organization, and and it did attract women uh, that became the leaders of the movement. Um, and I think that, gosh, I have so much to say on this topic. I don't even know where to start. Um, I I think that um, women both uh, recognize the harms. Uh, in a unique way, whether it's because um, it is affecting children, because it's affecting the community and just their role in the communities that they play, they may be more in tune to those effects. And I think um, women have been at the forefront of, frankly, every social and progressive movement. And so I think uh, it's it's critical to really recognize the role that they play in in deciding and and bringing others along. Um, and then I think it's also important to note that uh, there's an important racial component depending on the community that you're in. And so uh, recognizing that, you know, having a, a movement led only by white women is not a complete and total movement. And frankly, in a lot of these situations, recognizing who is affected and making sure there's space at the table for, uh, you know, intergenerational leadership, for cross-racial leadership, um, and across, uh, you know, all women or all folks who identify as women or as non-binary is really critical in this, in this fight as well. And so just naming that, yes, uh, has you know, historically played a really important role, but also, you know, how do, how does the fact that if women are leading that actually just lead to the movement being increasingly more inclusive? Yes, absolutely. All I, right. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> you know, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah. I, I definitely agree, Katie, that, that intersectional conversation is important. It's important to, um, recognize like traditional roles as well as the morphing roles of, of women and those who identify in that way today too. Um, I think as we explore recovering as a city and as a country and even globally after, after the pandemic, um, we, like cities or leadership is 
honestly, not just leadership, communities broadly are, are really faced with choices about how to ensure that um, we are building inclusive processes to move forward and to be stronger, right? Um, and then, and that means that we have to grapple with some of the inequities around gender um, that have existed, whether that has been barriers to the workplace. We know that many women were, um, have left the workspace at, due to the pandemic as well. Um, and getting them back into the workplace may be difficult or the types of jobs that we are looking to bring back or not may have influence there too. So it's, I think it's really important actually that we, as, especially as we're thinking about new economies or new jobs, whether it's clean energy or tra other transportation related issues like, the, like in the film that we'll see later, that we're really intentionally thinking about how to be inclusive in that space. Um, and as somebody who studied engineering at a predominantly white institution here, you know, like the gender lines are clear in terms of like who is in place, places and in rooms. And I'm very grateful for the, the faculty or staff that were really supportive or programs and fellow students who were really in, like really influential in saying like you belong here, whether that was as a black woman or as a woman period. Um, but as we grapple with who, who makes the decisions on some of these infrastructure choices or the structure of benefit programs, you know, it's important that we are in those spaces. And so I think for me, I don't think, I, I've learned from Katie, um, honestly, how to think about my, my, my role in space as a woman sometimes more critically and more uh, directly. But I know that that representation is critical, right? For, for every young person who is a high schooler who also got bit by this bug at, and comes up to me at a rally or asks me, where did I go to school or what I studied or how I got to where I am? That's important. And those conversations may seem so small or may get pushed to the idea of mentorship or something like that, but they're critical to um, ensuring that A, that there are people who just have, that there's a diversity of values. Let me just call, say broadly that that diversity of of values and um, or abilities and capabilities are in the room. Um, and I, I know that as a black woman, that that's different uh, than some typical or traditional spaces. Yeah, and if I can I just add one more thing that came up for me, Kyra, as you were saying that, you know, while women, you know, have been really leading when it comes to these movements beyond fossil fuels, and frankly, you know, the fossil fuel industry has been, you know, a very extractive, very male driven, uh, you know, entity. I think we are so hopeful in replacing that with clean energy, but at the same time, how do we make sure we're not just also reproducing a lot of similar problems in the clean energy industry as the, you know, in a, in a frankly male driven clean energy industry that was in the male driven fossil fuel industry. And so I think, especially when it comes to policymaking, it's critical why we need to have women, why we need to have women of color, um, people of color in the room shaping the policies that are sort of the guardrails for the new clean energy economy as well, because we don't just want to slap a solar panel on <laughs> the coal mm -hmm. mine, right? Like we want a fundamentally different system that values people, that values equity. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, it's, it's going to mean that those people are in the room and are in the decision-making spaces. And so that's how this is also interconnected. It means we need mm -hmm. female policy leaders. We need female lobbyists. We need female legislators. We need all of those things to make this, um, this leap forward. Yeah. Well, hear, hearing both of you speak to that really makes me even more appreciative of, uh, of the work that you two are doing, knowing that you are in the room. And hopefully our audience is hearing that as an invitation uh, to them as well. So we should uh, move on to the next two films. Um, and so um, Katie, if you could introduce Dangerous Neighbor and then Kyra, if you could introduce the uh, Community Power Indiana briefly, that would be great. And we'll move on and then we'll come back for some more discussion afterwards. So Katie. Happy to. Uh thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce this next film. Um, as Susan mentioned, I was um, honored to be one of the uh, founding members of the Central Illinois Healthy Community Alliance. And um, the, the journey that you're going to see in this next film, Dangerous Neighbor, really chronicles a battle against a polluting coal plant in Peoria, Illinois, um, and the coalition of, of groups that we built uh, 
uh, environmental groups, but not just environmental groups that were concerned about the pollution and organized a push for a cleanup and closure. So their lawsuit and their community organizing efforts um, succeeded in not only uh, securing a retirement date for this coal plant and a relief um, from the impacts of the plant, but in channeling funds back into the surrounding community. Incredible, just incredible. Thank you, Kyra. Sure. We're also going to see, yeah. We will also see Community <laughs> Power Indiana beyond the, um, beyond the line. And um, this is a pretty short film. So I, I'm really hoping that people see it and are inspired and maybe even have some questions about what can happen here in Chicago. Um, we will focus in this film on the city of Indianapolis and their uh, transition into clean transportation. Uh, through a fully bipartisan effort, Indigo, the Indianapolis Public Transportation Corporation, created the first and one of the largest fully electric bus rapid transit systems in the country. And so this means bringing faster, more efficient service and truly significant infrastructure upgrades to the system out in Indianapolis. Um, and I am really, really excited to, for the conversation after that too. So. I hope that you all enjoy these next two shows. Me too. And I'm glad you're here, Kyra, because you can tell us what is going down in Chicago on that front too. Awesome. So together, these two films are about 25 minutes. So I hope you'll stay with us and we'll run through the same uh, formula where we'll at invite you to share your reflections and questions uh, in the chat. So tech team, let's let it roll. Thank you. Everybody, welcome back. I invite you again in the chat to enter if there was a particular scene or person or line, something that stood out to you in these uh, second two films. And woo hoo, right? Thank you, Katie, for changing the rules. Um, what a, I'm just touched by what a thoughtful resolution it was, incorporating the uh, the diversity of values that Kyra mentioned uh, just before we watched these, and so focused on the needs of the community. Um, yeah, and of course I loved, it's becoming cooler and cooler to care. Yes, let's make that cool. Let's make caring cool. So I invite you in, do we have anything going on in the chat? I'm eager to dive back in with our amazing women here, Katie and Kyra. Uh, if stuff comes in, I'm sure that my team uh, working behind the scene and you would not believe how many people are here supporting us. It's, it's uh, just, I'm so grateful to the whole team at One Earth. Um, so I'd love to invite Katie and Kyra back in um, to our conversation. For the last, we have just about a half an hour uh, or less, and we want to get to action points as well. So just to remind you, and maybe you just joined us, that Katie McFadden is the president of McFadden Strategies and was featured in the uh, Dangerous Neighbor film we just saw. And Kyra Woods is a policy advisor with the city of Chicago, and she is eventually going to tell us about uh, Chicago's version of this uh, clean energy that we uh, touched upon with the Indigo film. So uh, something I feel like it's really important to uplift, uh, especially when we are focused on a theme of clean energy, is the energy focused on small wins, especially in these last two films. I feel like this is really regenerative energy, especially as activists. So I'd love to hear from each of you. Um, we hear from Joe Lakota, you know, uplifting small victories. Um, and we know this can be slow, hard work. It took 10 years, um, you know, what, what y'all accomplished down there. So I'd love to hear you each speak. And um, why don't we start with you, Katie, since you were just in that film and Kyra, um, we'll go to you. So um, what about this? <laughs> how, we, how important it is to focus on the long timeline and the small win is what my question is. Yeah, you know, uh, re-watching the film really took me back to, uh, you know, what was it like when we first decided to tackle this campaign? And while it can feel like a small win at the time, it felt like an actual insurmountable task. You know, we're sitting around a kitchen table saying, hey, we want to close down the largest polluter in the county. Uh, you know, is this something that we all here are capable of. Um, and so at, at the time, sort of really how big it felt. And, and it was something I was imagining and watching the first film as well um, about the fight in Puerto Rico, where 
you know, we really were part of this collective movement, even when we didn't really know it. And so there were communities across the country and, uh, you know, beyond this country, um, uh, deciding that, you know, it's time that we stand up to the polluters in our backyard. And what that really created was this, you know, movement where there were a lot of choice points for fossil fuel polluters. Um, in the first film, you heard about the renewed contract that they stopped. In our film, you heard about, you know, deciding that we're not going to let them get away with you know, hundreds of violations of the Clean Air Act every year. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's through lawsuit combined with community power, it really built to this collective movement where folks were saying, look, it, we're actually not going to be okay with this as a source of power. We're not going to be okay with the collective sacrifice um, that we're being asked to endure because we know a better, a better future is possible. So, yeah, I think, you know, just really reflecting on how, how big it felt at the time and you know you watch the documentary it seems like oh of course you're gonna win it seems like an easy win but at the time you know we didn't even know if a reporter would ever come to our first press conference let alone that the you know company itself would be concerned with what we had to say so uh it's, it really shows you uh and to Joyce's point in the film how much um you know a group of small determined people really can make a difference mm, yeah beautiful thanks for naming that Katie thank you Kyra yeah, so both films are, it was actually really great to see some familiar faces um, in the, in technically it's film two, but the first of the two that we just watched. Um, and I, I, but I'm right now sitting with this line from the second film um, that features Indigo about watching communities be revitalized in front of your eyes because of the access to transportation, um, and truly like that is one element of it, but then also thinking about an, an electric bus system. Um, and if you've ever ridden behind a school bus or a C like any bus, doesn't have to be a CTA bus alone, um, you know that, that that is a a lot of dirty air to breathe in, you know? And so thinking about um, not just access to transportation or more efficient transportation, but affordable and clean transit also being a part of the revitalization that can happen. Um, and so I found myself, you know, I don't know, just drifting off a little bit, thinking about what that could look like in a city like Chicago, what that will look like in a city like Chicago. Um, just, you know, given how big we are, given how, um, how vast our bus system is, and then also understanding some of the health disparities that we, that we work uh, within. So um, I left both films being like, hopeful and also just a full heart, really grateful for the collaboration between partners. Absolutely. So to, to that uh, part, and Kyra, maybe I'll just stay with you for an hour, a mm -hmm. minute just to shake it up a little and then we'll go to Katie. Um, David uh, Sincox in the chat has a question about how do we impress on people that um, the environment needs to be bipartisan or even better nonpartisan. And I would even uh, widen that question to, to, for both of you is how do you go about engaging such a variety of stakeholders uh, in your work? Kind of what are your, your tricks and tips there? I think we can all <laughs> learn something. So I'll start with you, Kyra, thanks. Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think it's most important to help people see themselves in an issue right? The, as soon as people divide themselves from it or don't see themselves as a part of the problem or solution, um, it, can, it can sometimes feel like pulling teeth <laughs> because you, whether it's wanting somebody's participation or wanting their vote or, you know, um, a public statement, like, you have to help people see themselves in the issue. Um, and so that personal connection is important. And whether that is through, um, you know, through building deeper relationships or simply thinking about the reflective questions that you ask people to wrestle with as they um, see the billboard, as they listen to your promotional materials, as they sit in on a meeting, even if they maybe haven't decided whether they're for or against the thing, um, it's really helping people identify their place in it. And so I think about those questions of even thinking back to the first film, how many people do you know that um, have an inhaler? right? Or have gone to the hospital. I was thinking about several people in the first film who lost family members um, after Hurricane Maria due to the lack of access to medical care, right? Or, or medicine. Um, and that being a personal connection that maybe you yourself were like, ah, this isn't for me, but this does impact me or it has left an impact. 
And so I think that personal connection is, is critical. And, and sometimes it's not an environmental issue. I think that's also what we are really pushing um, in this conversation these days is that, you know, for some people, everybody doesn't have the same like definition or relationship with the environment. Um, but I think people can identify with the basic needs of life, whether it's access to food or clean air and clean water and uh, clean land around them. And um, others may on the line may say, of course, all of that is environment, but I think the framing of it is really critical. Oh, even going back to that first response of when you sh show somebody a picture of a beach, they may not have the same interaction or the same um, relationship with that beachfront. And so really getting to that personal impact is critical. Mm, that's that's really great, Cara. Thank you. Katie, what is your secret sauce? Well, I think when you're um, when you're up close and you're talking about community impacts, it it really doesn't become partisan. It's you know, it's not about you know this bigger issue. It's about, you know, there's this toxic pollutant that's sitting next to the river that you ride your boat in on the weekends, or it's, you know, the air that your children are breathing. And so, you know, it's, it, it becomes really kind of easier at the local level. I will say you're just, you're talking to people, you're talking to neighbors, you're discussing issues about their community. And it, it, I think becomes easier to really be human with folks and it not to get quickly very partisan and people come into this for all different reasons, right? So, uh, you know, there are the people, as Joyce mentioned in the film, that are there because of climate change, but there are people that were, you know, part of the movement because their kids literally had asthma. And so it, you know, if you can build a space where all of the reasons are valid, and in fact, we, you know, have built community and, and bonds between the shared goal, which, um, you know, as was stated in the film from the beginning was not just to close the coal plant, but for a just transition. And if that meant it stayed open longer so that we could have that, um, you know, just exit from the community, that was from day one, something that we were willing to do. Uh, if you could sign your name to that, then, you know, you can be part of the team and help us figure out how to do it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I often think, thinking of this quote of like, make caring cool, we all care about something. And I think that piece of finding the similarities, right, um, sounds like you both are holding space for that and asking the questions and, and I don't, you know, without the judgment. Um, and, and I'm thinking about community power, this other theme throughout uh, the films. And so I'd love before we move into action to ask you each, um, because you're so, um, you have so much expertise uh, through experience with community organizing. And, and I'm thinking even in the first film, we saw the training um, when they sat down and said, all right, listen, we're going to make mistakes, right? But we're not going to accuse each other. And we're also not going to limit ourselves, right? There were a lot of like really practical tips like that. Um, and, and it feels to me, I've been in community organizing for a long time too, but it feels like there's a new approach that we're seeing uh, lately in, in these films. So I'd love you each just to, to spend a little bit of time. Um, if you just wanna highlight some piece, I know, I think together you two could like host a whole course on this, which would be really cool. Um, but what could you give our audience tonight? Just a little bit about, you know, if they're kind of listening and they're like, all right, what can I do here? So um, Katie, I'll start with you and then go to Kyra. Sure. Um, where to start? I think I said this earlier, but you know, it's easy to walk, watch a documentary and for it to feel very linear. <laughs> uh, it didn't feel linear at the time. It felt like we were doing a lot of work, doing a lot of work, and then we'd hit another roadblock or, you know, we had some interim losses. There were, um, there was a year when we spent a lot of time trying to get the state to not issue the coal plant an additional variance to allow them to pollute longer and we went to public hearings and submitted comments and the state said, no, actually it's fine for them to be polluting longer. And so, you know, it, to be able to have a team that, you, that can pick itself back up after those losses and say, that's not the end. Like now we just have to get creative, um, even more creative than before. Uh, and to really be able to keep hope alive. And I felt a lot of times like 
uh, my role as an organizer in the community was uh, largely a cheerleader <laughs> and saying, look, we can actually do this. This is possible. Look at all the people who believe in this. Um, and uh, just really trying to keep that hope alive. And so for folks who are watching, I think it's kind of comes down to, again, what Joyce said in the film. I kind of feel like we don't have any other option. What are we going to do? Just not? fight for our values and what we believe in and, and make the better world that we know is possible. And just knowing that, you know, there's going to be those um, times when you don't win, but you're with a really amazing crew of people through the hard parts and, and through the wins as well. So. Mm, thank you so much there. Thanks, Katie. I'm thinking of the idea that uh, my mom frequently says we need to bake a bigger pie. Uh, right? Whether it's this idea of wanting to see it at the table, sometimes you need to bring your own chair because there aren't actually enough seats. Um, and then sometimes you just need to, you know, there aren't enough slices, but like the pie actually is, th that construct honestly can be so problematic because it it's a zero sum game, right? For me to get something, somebody else has to give something up. And I, I really am encouraged by the idea right now that there's room um, and if there's not, <laughs> that we need to make a bigger pie. So the, the bring your, um, uh, I think it's if you don't, if they don't give you a seat, bring your own, bring your own folding chair. That's actually a Shirley Chisholm quote, I believe. And I, I, I really appreciate that. And I think that's the moment that we're kind of in. If there's room, let's make room. Um, and given everything about recovering from COVID-19, uh, the economic downturn, the environmental moment that we are in, given in, in, and not just environmental, but I think really that climate justice moment that we're grappling with around the urgency of climate change. Like we're in a moment where we need to think critically about, are we working with this small pie or are we imagining a different, uh, a different world? Yeah. Awesome. And who else needs to be at this table? Maybe we need bigger, much bigger tables, right? Yeah. Awesome. So I'd love to hear before I invite our audience into their action items, I'd love to hear um, from each of you what you're up to now. Um, I know Chicago um, has a really uh, big vision uh, ahead of uh, ahead of us. So what are you up to? How can we get more involved with um, each of you? Um, Kyra, go for it. Sure. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think I first want to say thank you to the One Earth Film Festival family and for all of those watching, um, for the ways that you may have participated in some of these things actually to date. Uh, we recently wrapped up about a month ago now, uh, our oh, not that long ago, our public comment period for the uh, 2022 Climate Action Plan. And so if you were someone who wrote in or maybe attended a town hall back in January, I appreciate you. I My team has read and reread comments. Um, and we're really looking forward to using that to those comments to refine the draft um, plan that was online. So thank you in advance. Thank you right now. And I hope that in advance of the official launch of our final climate action plan, maybe you see yourself in there, you maybe see your comments in there. And I think this is one small way that maybe you weren't quite ready to join a full rally, or maybe you weren't ready to um, host a meeting with a group you were in, but you were willing to write a comment, that counts. And that is a small way that you can take action. Um, and so when the climate action plan is out there and look for that very soon, I encourage everybody to read it. You can follow our page at chicago.gov backslash climate for more information um, and to be updated when that actually drops. Um, and then I would also encourage folks to stay tuned for more around our bus electrification process. Back in 2019, the city committed to transitioning our entire uh, electricity load to clean renewable power by 2035 and transitioning our bus fleet to an electric bus fleet by 2040. So 2040 is right around the corner and we're so grateful that our sister agency uh, the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority, did release a bus electrification plan. Uh, it's their roadmap. And so we are excited to be a part of some of that next step visioning and implementation as they decide how to make those investments and which lines to transition when. Um, and so stay tuned for conversations that may happen in a neighborhood near you or maybe across the city as we try to set up those first steps. So uh, I'll be sure to drop both links in the chat uh, for future action, but stay tuned for some more Earth Week activities. Clean and Green is happening this weekend, so you can call your alderman's office or your ward office to find out if there's a cleanup event happening in your neighborhood. Um, but I hope that we 
all get to enjoy some of the good weather that we're having. We'll have. <laughs> it's a little chilly still. It's coming. It's coming, right? It's coming. <laughs> thanks, Kyra. Well, thanks for all that. Amazing. Um, Katie. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So um, after 10 years at Sierra Club, I uh, decided it was time to try something new. So I now run my own political consulting firm where I uh, advise uh, a number of environmental nonprofits. Uh, so I'm still doing very similar work and just helping make the impact even larger here in the state. So uh, one uh, of my major clients is with the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, who uh, was the coalition that really fought hard to pass the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act last September, which is uh, something that the environmental community here in Illinois is very, very proud of, the strongest, most equitable, uh, equity-centered state climate legislation in the country and really is a model for the entire um, for the entire planet. I always like to share that a week after the bill was passed, our governor and speaker of the House and Senate president actually traveled to the international UN climate talks because they were invited to talk about how significant this piece of state legislation was for our entire world. And so that is what we were able to do. And you saw that in the end of the film, but it was led by frontline communities Communities like those in Peoria, like the folks in Peoria who, yes, fought their backyard coal plant and then said, this isn't enough. We're going to keep fighting so that other communities uh, have the same relief from coal pollution, um, from, from dirty gas pollution uh, that we have. And so that bill puts Illinois on track to um, to get to 100% clean energy. And so things that folks can do, uh, first, we need to make sure that we're defending uh, CJA from any possible attacks in the legislature and beyond. So if uh, you're part of an environmental organization in the state, you're likely part of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, or if not, we hope you'll join. Uh, so you can help us as we defend that law, but also work to implement it. Uh, we need to make sure that we can do it uh, and show what's possible in the state and, and hopefully even surpass our goals. Um, and one other thing I want to mention is, is we talked a little bit about in two of the films, um, coal ash pollution. Uh, we're, we're so proud to have also in, uh, passed some really strong coal ash regulations in the state of Illinois, um, but we are currently working to make sure that they get implemented by the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency in just the strongest way possible for communities like Peoria, uh, communities who have coal plants or have coal plants that are closing down and still have these enormous pits of this toxic, toxic sludge that's left in their community that they deserve to clean that up after the coal plant is, is closed. And so um, we have an action alert that we're going to share with you. And we hope that you'll uh, be part of our growing community that is asking the state to ensure um, really strong coal ash protections. Wow. All right. I hope you all are as just amazed and awestruck as I am. I could talk to you two rock stars for the next two hours, except I'm, I'm aware that you probably need to sleep occasionally to, uh, to rejuvenate and regenerate because of all that you're involved in. Um, I hope that you all have seen some really interesting threads about the Sierra Club and how much time each of these women spent there. Kind of an interesting thread there. Uh, the Peace Corps, uh, Kyra spent some time there as well. Some really beautiful training ground and then some, some interesting overlap. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you both. Um, as I promised at the beginning, Anna finds the most amazing, perfect folks for these films. So thank you for helping bring these films alive and for all that you do uh, for all of us here on the planet and in Illinois especially. Um, so before I move to action, do you have any, any final words, Kyra or Katie? I don't, just before we say. Action's where it's at. Let's go to action. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, then I'm going to um, to turn to you. Our our uh, thank you all for participating. I can't see how many of you are still here with us, uh, but for our final minutes here, this is an inv your invitation to join the movement. Uh, we like to invoke the wonderful spirit of Amanda Gorman, our National Youth Poet Laureate. Back to our youthful energy, um, she calls us to action in her beautiful poem Earthrise. And if you haven't heard this, please go hear it in her voice. Uh, I'll quote part of it there. This is no rehearsal. The time is now, now, now. Earth, pale blue dot, we will fail you not. So this is the time you are needed. I hope you feel that it is possible and you can engage now with us. Um, we'll have a slide pop up here soon. We will send you all of this in the next um, couple of weeks. We'll share the resources, a recording of this conversation. 
uh, action items, the transcript of the chat. But I'd like you to look at this and maybe um, Kyra and Katie, you can help me because you have younger eyes as well, but maybe you can help shout out some, um, some pieces of this slide that they're throwing up here for us, take action. So could you each highlight that in case folks aren't seeing? And then what I'd love the audience, if you could pop into the chat, something that you, maybe something that's drawing you or that you're even willing to commit to. Um, so go ahead, Katie, what do you see that, that you want to shout sure, out? Yeah, I think, I think both of ours are in the bottom right corner. Um, so if you see take action to strengthen the coal ash rules, we'd love your name on that. Um, and that'll help you ensure that we have just a, really the strongest coal ash protections in the state that we can. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Kyra. Absolutely. So I, I said thank you for the Climate Action Plan comments. I will say thank you again and really look forward to your engagement as we move forward with implementation. It is full of different actions and strategies that we'll need to design and um, move along. So stay tuned for that. Um, other elements on this page that are drawing my attention are, um, oh yeah, this the, the Clean Transportation Action Toolkit. I think it's I, I was on another call and somebody said, you guys really like toolkits. I said, organizers do like toolkits. So um, <laughs> yes. I, I, I think that's a great one to check out and, and you know potentially explore how you and your community may be able to implement it or create something for your own. And I know that we've got guests joining us from across the country. So um, be inspired. There are always really, really great actions packed onto this slide. And so look for these in your, your email. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. We're getting some, uh, continue this thread of gratitude you started, Kyra, in, in the chat. So thank you. And um, really, we'd love for you to help us turn the tide um, and to learn more about our panelists and stay in touch with their work. There um, are links coming up on the slide, and I know uh, our team in the chat uh, has been putting those in as well. Of course, if you found value in today's event, we would love for you to donate to the One Earth Film Fest. Uh, continue to join us at events. There are uh, some wonderful Earth Day events coming up all week long. And um, my thank you is to this amazing team that helps this all just somehow happen magically, most of which I cannot do. Um, so thank you to Sam and Garen and of course, Anna and Lisa. There's so many folks behind the, uh, the scenes here. I'm deeply grateful for you all uh, for letting me just be here and be able to engage in this conversation, which is what I love to do. We want to thank our partners at the City of Chicago. We've got Kyra here on their behalf tonight, which is awesome uh, for co-hosting this Earth Week mini film fest with us. And we thank each of you for being here with us and participating. And we wish you all a wonderful evening and Earth Week. So be well, take care, take care. get involved. We need you. Thank you.